Hello and uh, good morning, early morning, uh, almost 4 a in the morning, uh, coming to you from Washington, D.C. Thank you to the conference organizers for, for having me, and I'm thrilled to be sharing uh, our recent research. Today, I'd like to speak a little bit about innovation in arts and cultural education as a subsection of the intangible cultural heritage sector and the adaptations that have come amid a global pandemic. My name is Jeff M. Poulin and I am the founder and managing director of Creative Generation, as well as an adjunct professorial lecturer at American University and an adjunct instructor at Carnegie Mellon University in Washington, DC and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, respectively. Creative Generation is an international NGO that is dedicated to the development of thriving communities and a more just world. We achieve this through our work inspiring, connecting, and amplifying the work of young creatives who catalyze social transformation in their communities and those adult allies who are committed to cultivating their creative capabilities. In March and April of the year 2020, we began an inquiry, initially focused on understanding how the educational aspects of the arts and cultural sector were impacted by COVID-19 in hopes to better understand how it may play out and how we may be able to pivot or adapt in support of the next generation. However, as it began to unfold with our inquiry here in the United States, we understood very quickly that there were multiple pandemics at play. The first being a global health crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic, the resulting economic recession. In the United States, there was an increase of violence against black lives, most uh, commonly at the hands of police and a political divisiveness in our country as a result of our upcoming election. What resulted from these circumstances was an upending of our policies in communities that shone a light on the widespread inequalities within our systems, exposing the systemic racism and injustice that had been built into our community's policies for decades. So we came to understand the definition of what really was facing young people as a full burden, to use the term from epidemiologists, a full burden of injustice that was impacting the lives of young people. So our inquiry no longer became about the COVID-19 pandemic but instead became about understanding how ICH and the more specific arts and cultural education as a component of the work of ICH NGOs to address that full burden facing young people and allow them to continue to thrive within their own development. So we began looking at the subsection of our field known here in the United States as creative youth development, which may be a new term to many of you. It's defined as a long-standing theory of practice, which intentionally integrates positive youth development principles with arts and cultural education. These organizations are non-governmental organizations, nonprofit in nature, that are based in communities embedded within neighborhoods. They are highly valued by those who are participating in them, young people, caregivers, families, community members, and more, but are largely vulnerable, living paycheck to paycheck, grant to grant. In the initial response to the COVID-19 pandemic, these CYD organizations, creative youth development organizations, were left behind in the coordinated emergency funds that were given to the arts and cultural sector, which often favored the large brick and mortar cultural institutions like large museums, opera houses, dance companies, and theaters. So as a result, the development, the creative and cultural development of young people 
were left behind as well with no financial support when they needed an increased financial support to address that full burden of young people. So we got to work. We met with 47 different programs across the United States, some of which were catalyzed by networks throughout the state of Massachusetts in the county of San Diego, California and elsewhere. And we listened to their leaders leaders that were not only the CEOs or chief executives of the organizations, but also volunteer members of their board and young people, youth decision makers in advisory capacities. And we heard a lot of questions, some of which we grouped into five different categories that you can see here in the diagram on the left. We asked the question, how are your programs constructing new pathways through the crisis? And what we learned was that there were essentially three phases. The first was around initial concern. Can we pay our staff? Are the young people healthy? When will we be able to open our doors? Then next we heard a second round of questions. How can we collaborate with funders differently to address our changing needs? How can we ensure the health and well being of our teaching artists, our staff, through self, self care and avoid online burnout? And then lastly, we heard long term questions about thinking about restructuring organizations. How do we increase our programs? How do we equip our organizations in the virtual space for the future? Ultimately, these fell into five categories that you see on the right hand side of your screen. Around harnessing internal reflections and insights, building productive collaborations, strengthening program design, improving organizational stability and sustainability, and instigating shared leadership. To better understand this and to look towards the future, we looked towards the scholarship first. We understood that through these questions, organizations were entering an organizational development phase, whether they knew it or not, whether a cultural festival, out of school time program, or community based cultural organization, we found that they were moving through what Kurt Lewin would call his freezing, changing and unfreezing phases of development. As we looked back in time, we noticed that these responses of organizations were consistent regarding this pandemic, the response to the 9-11 terrorist attacks, the 2008 financial collapse, or regional force majeure events like wildfires in the state of California or Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans in 2006. So we wanted to help organizations think differently about their response in a time of crisis, regardless of what their work was. Here, we offer a model that was adapted from Carl Ronke and Aljay Alvarado's models that share the comfort, fear, learning and opportunity zones that help people discuss how they respond in a crisis. For us, listening to these program, pro, programmatic leaders, we heard first that organizations exist in what we call their comfort zone, which is seen at the center of this diagram. When that comfort zone, or the space where they're most comfortable doing their work, where they excel in their programming, when that area is disrupted by a crisis, for example, like the COVID-19 pandemic, which is represented by the purple line on this, this diagram, it launches organizations immediately into a fear and uncertainty zone where they're unsure what is next. They don't know necessarily how to address the changing circumstances that they face. Quickly though, organizations naturally adapt. They gain insight, and learning from those changing circumstances as they move through the crisis. Here is where we see the move to online programming, the innovation of uh, changing spaces and health mandates like mask wearing and so forth. But here is where the paths diverge. Organizations largely make a choice during this insight and learning zone. 
In some cases, they short circuit. They wrap back around to go back to their comfort zone. Naturally, they are inclined to do what they know how to do best. Others though, push through that insight and learning zone and inculcate sustained opportunities in their work where they learn, innovate, and instill that within their regular programmatic needs. This is what we call the opportunity scenario and where real innovation amid a crisis can occur to address the changing needs of the time and future proof their intangible cultural heritage work for changing circumstances in the future. In some cases, we found that this was easy and natural to organizations. Others needed serious financial investment or investment of time and people power in order to achieve those goals. Simultaneously, as, we, as our inquiry was expanding to uh, that model within the United States, International Arts Education Week was being hosted by UNESCO. We worked with UNESCO to identify a series of good practices, some 40 programs happening around the world that looked specifically at the innovation within arts and cultural education during the changes of the pandemic. In a review of these programs, we found that over 50% of them changed their practices responding to the pandemic. The other 50% largely put their programming on hold. Of those 50% that innovated, 100% of them relied on digital delivery and internet connections for their work. One third of those that were studied provided additional services for young people, particularly focused on how arts and culture could contribute to the mental health and well being of the next generation. 40% supported non traditional educators or at home educators like parents, caregivers, community elders, and others. These good practices modeled the same type of innovation that we saw in our study of creative youth development programs in the United States, which allows us to draw some conclusions about how intangible cultural heritage and really other types of arts and culture organizations around the world adapted to a crisis. What we ultimately understood is that there was an interdependence between the arts and culture sector and digital delivery through the use of the internet. This creates the health concerns for safe distancing, but also allows for a democratization of learning and knowledge consumption. It allows for young people to participate in intangible cultural heritage programs, like the festivals just seen in the preceding di dialogue, without a need for being physically present. In fact, in many cases, it increased participation for young people in disparate and more rural areas of the regions. However, there is a concern about the digital gap or increased access to computers, other technology, and access to the internet. Second, we must consider how we connect the arts and cultural heritage work to the pressing needs of young people in communities, like their mental and physical well being. How can arts, culture, and ICH address the mental health and physical well being of young people, particularly with the rapid increases? in diagnosed depression, suicide rates, and other challenges facing youth today. And third, we must consider how organizations can conduct themselves with humility and empower other educators. Checking egos at the door, we must think about the democratization of knowledge sharing and how our ICH NGOs can empower other types of educators beyond our own staffs, like parents, elders, and others 
in homes and communities to ensure that young people continue learning through arts and culture, continue engaging with heritage, and continue the dialogues within their communities when we cannot be physically present or gathered together. We offer these considerations as provocations from this work because we are still in the midst of a global pandemic. Can we really draw conclusions? Who knows? But what we learned from our studies in March and April in the United States and May and June looking globally through UNESCO was simply this. We must adapt. We must change. And instead of going back to what we always did well, we must look to those changes for new innovations. Innovations that can learn, that can uh, be engaged for more democratized learning, increased support for young people and their mental and physical well being, and a shift in how we engage with communities in their learning about intangible cultural heritage. I thank you for listening to this presentation and welcome a, an increased dialogue in the future. I can be reached at this email address or through our website or on social media. I thank you very much for listening to this presentation.